once around pulsar planets. Who would have thought that these remnants of a supernova, these collapsed cores, neutron stars, rotating rapidly as a result of the conservation of angular momentum, just like a skater, when they pull their arms in on an ice rink, they spin up faster. As the core of a giant star collapses in an implosion to form a neutron star, that neutron star will be spun up to very wild speeds indeed. And of course, neutrons have a magnetic moment, so the result is a highly magnetic rotating object, perhaps the uh, one and a half times the mass of our sun spinning 30 times a second. They beam out radio pulses along uh, out towards us. And if they happen to come to Earth, we can hear them with our radio telescopes. Jocelyn Belbonnel discovered the first one using the IPS array at the Mullard radio telescopes just south of Cambridge a number of years ago, since when, of course, we have found a very large number of these interesting objects. But it's somewhat surprising to think about the idea that such a rotating neutron star or pulsar could have any pl surviving planets that managed to go through the supernova explosion and not be completely destroyed. But this uh, is made a little bit more difficult for us because we don't seem to be finding planets around massive stars. Now, it could be that the early days of a massive star see such a large amount of radiation, uh, solar winds and so on, pouring off the star that the disk of gas and dust, the protoplanetary disk out of which the planets could potentially condense, never gets a chance and is blown away. So maybe we're not seeing planets around these giants because there aren't any, they never get a hope of forming. But another factor is that actually, when a star of this mass goes through its evolutionary life cycle and swells up into the giant phase, the hydrogen in the core is exhausted, you end up with an inert ball of helium surrounded by a shell of hydrogen fusing away, driving the outer layers outwards, turning it into a giant star, these things can swallow all the innermost planets of a system. We think that the Earth may well get swallowed when our sun swells up, and our sun is only a fairly modest star. These giants will do so much more rapidly and to a larger size. So it could be that uh, any inner planets don't stand a chance in the surviving the giant phase, let alone getting to the supernova. The other factor is that further out, such planets have less influence on their stars. If someone were to try to discover Jupiter by looking at the sun and waiting for a transit event, they would have to wait perhaps to see it three, four or five times, passing in front of the line of sight and blocking some of the light from the star in order to be sure. And that's going to take 12 years for each orbit. So to see three, you have to wait at least 24 years, probably longer. And to really be sure, you may have to wait, I don't know, 50 or 60 years to get enough data from enough transits to be sure that what you're seeing is a real planet. And the other methods that rely on the gravitational wobble caused to the star by the mass of the planet in orbit also don't work so well if the planet is further away. Uh, clearly the force of gravity reduces as a square of the distance and of course with these giant stars the mass ratio is hugely in favour of the star anyway. So maybe it shouldn't be a surprise that we're not able to find such objects around these giant stars. And of course when the supernova explodes it ejects about 50% of the overall mass of the system in a very violent explosion. And any uh, planets or indeed the resulting pulsar right out of the core of the star may well get quite a big kick as these somewhat irregular explosions go off. And that could cause the 
pulsar and the planet to be accelerated, not even in the same direction, perhaps. And there's a very, very good chance that the result will be that the planet becomes unbound, no longer attached to the uh, gravitational influence of the pulsar, not least of which is because the pulsar has only got half the mass now. So the planet's probably got too much velocity for its orbit, even before it gets a kick. Um, so there's a good chance that these planets might get lost and escape the system and become rogue planets orbiting the uh, galaxy all on their own. But after a supernova explosion, you may well get a disk of material forming around the resulting pulsar, the ejected material gathering together. It has to be cold in order to do this. If it's very hot, the energy will just prevent this from happening. So it needs to cool down first, so it might take a while, but you might get a planet forming out of one of these disks. And such a planet would be very interesting. It would be very rich in metals, the heavy elements, and loaded with radioisotopes because these supernova remnants are absolutely stuffed full of radioactive material. And well, we haven't found any of these either. But a third possibility exists that the pulsar could acquire material from a companion star. If there was a, a binary star system, one explodes and forms a pulsar, and the second star survives this, then it could reach the evolutionary stage where it too swells into a giant. And when they do that, they tend to not have very strong grip on their outer layers, and the material can overflow into what's called the Roche limit, the point where the gravity of the pulsar is actually going to win, and the material spirals down into an accretion disk feeding the pulsar, but perhaps also forming a planet in and around the pulsar. You might even be in the situation where the star, the companion star, could get stripped of its outer layers by the energy from the pulsar, or indeed <clears throat> from the supernova, and that that could leave a planet-sized remnant behind. Now, that might be very much rich in carbon, especially if it came from a white dwarf star. Most white dwarf stars originate from stars a little heavier than the sun, and as a result, they create a core where they have fused helium into carbon in the center and some oxygen as well. And such a system could be described as a black widow, or indeed you could describe it as a planet made of diamond because the carbon is likely to crystallize in the immense pressures inside such a massive object as the core of a white dwarf. But finally, piracy. You might well find that the pulsar is able to steal planets from a companion star system. You might have an innocent star system sat next door as a part of a binary system or just relatively nearby, and the pulsar might end up wandering into the system and stealing all the planets. And of course, it could capture any wandering rogue planets that happen by, but I think that's perhaps the least likely of all of these mechanisms. So how would we go about finding pulsars with planets? Well, this, the mechanism is to use the fact that the rotating pulsar, so you have one and a half times the mass of the sun in a volume just uh, contained in a ball 20 kilometers across, spinning round 30 times a second, there's a lot of angular momentum tied up in such a thing, and they are very, very stable as a result. So the pulses are regular as clockwork. That's what caused Jocelyn Bell Burnell to write LGM on the paper tape, thinking that the pulses she was seeing were so regular, they could perhaps come from aliens. Somewhat tongue in cheek, not entirely serious, but a good joke. Anyway, so we have these regular signals coming from the pulsar, but if the pulsar has a companion and is moving back and forth slightly, caused by the gravitation of its uh, binary partner, 
then we would see that in the timing of the arrival of the pulses and we would be able to infer the presence of the companion, be that a star or indeed a planet. Now, rather famously, back in 1991, Andrew Lynn and Matthew Bales were studying pulsars, in particular PSR 1829-10, a 1.4 solar mass pulsar 30,000 light years away. Uh, these radio signals are detectable at very long distances. And he produced results indicating that there was a planet in a six-month-long orbit. And this would have been the first report of an exoplanet around any star, pulsar or ordinary star. This was years before the discovery of 51 Pegasi B and the exoplanet rush that then followed. However, in doing these measurements, you have to correct for the motion of the Earth. The Earth goes around the sun in 12 months, and so the wobble of the pulsar is combined with the to and fro motion of the Earth. So you have to subtract this out. And Andrew had indeed done this before dealing with and announcing the result. But the Earth's orbit is, in fact, slightly elliptical. It goes around the sun in an ellipse with the sun at one focus, just like Kepler's laws told us. And as it's at the perihelion, the near point, it moves a little faster. And as it's further away, it moves a little slower. Also something that Kepler taught us. So, in fact, you don't have to subtract a regular 12-month cycle in calculating what the pulsar is actually doing from the observations. You have to allow for the speeding up and slowing down of the Earth. Otherwise, it will inject a six-month variation in the timings, which, of course, is what happened. And so Andrew Lynn's planet did not exist. We also have to do this with sundials. If you go to a sundial, you will find a little plaque on it, labelling it with the equation of time, which sounds like something from Doctor Who, but in fact is just simply telling you how far or behind, ahead or behind, the sun is compared to a normal clock as a result of this change in the Earth's orbital speed around the sun on its journey. However, just a year later, another group of astronomers analysing another pulsar got a valid answer. PSR 1257 plus 12 is now named Lich and has three planets, B, C and D. B, the uh, innermost planet, is tiny, just 2% uh, of the mass of the Earth. C is 4.3 and D, 3.9. And these were announced and confirmed in uh, 1992 to 1994, as you can see there, along with the other data about them. Now, these have been considered relatively important discoveries, and the international community has started to allow uh, competitions and nominations for names of stars uh, and, indeed, exoplanets. So the star is named Lich. And the first planet, B, has now been given the name Dragur, and it's roughly the size of Mercury, 33% the Earth's radius, only 2% of the mass. Um, that shouldn't be a surprise, because if you're uh, one-third the radius, you're one-twenty-seventh of the volume, um, which is not much different to uh, just a few percent. So relatively under dense, perhaps, suggesting that it doesn't have an iron core or anything, um, perhaps made of lighter elements. And getting some energy from the pulsar, raising it up to just a chilly minus seven. The second planet out, planet C, has been given the name Poltergeist. I love that. It's double the radius of the Earth, so it encompasses eight times the volume but only has 4.2 times the mass, again, relatively under dense, suggesting it's not made of a metal core. Um, and being further away from the source of energy, a chilly minus 80. And the third one, Phobator, 
is also a super earth, 150% the size of the earth um, and 3.9 times the mass. So same story for this. And these are possibly um, going to be very carbon rich and they may well have resulted from the disruption of one of those carbon white dwarf stars uh, that have, has then recondensed into this planetary system orbiting around the pulsar. I find it just amazing that we are able to infer the presence of these guys. You wouldn't really want to go there on your holidays due to the low temperatures, but also due to the intense radiation that they must be being subject to from the pulsar. It's going to strip away any uh, atmosphere. There's going to be matter antimatter streams coming from the pulsar electrons and positrons irradiating the surface thoroughly nasty place indeed um, so with that i'll just leave you with this graphic of uh, the star lich and its uh, three known planets the first pulsar planets to be discovered and thanks very much for listening